we want to encourage you to get involved in the Go program, which helps to support many ministries that are making an impact in our church, our community, and all over the globe. Each month, on the first Sunday of the month, we give you the opportunity to support these great ministries. When you give to Go, it supports church ministries that helps provide a home and education to children that are unwanted or orphaned. It helps troubled teenage boys find structure and guidance in their life. It helps get the Word of God into our teenagers through Bible quizzing and through camps and other student events. It helps to support and build brand new churches that are starting right here in North America and more. When you give to go, it supports community ministries that helps provide disaster relief to those that are in need. It helps provide pregnant young women with support to prevent abortions. It helps to protect our religious liberties right here in the United States. And it helps our Hands for Healing ministry feed thousands of families each week right here in Brevard County. Also, when you give to go, it supports global ministries that helps to build churches and orphanages all around the world. And it helps to hold crusades and see thousands of people receive the Holy Ghost and receive a miracle from God. And it helps to provide financial support to missionaries all around the globe. When you become a part of Go, together we impact and spread the love of God all over our church, our community, and our world. Praise the Lord, church, and welcome to our Wednesday night service. We're so glad that you have joined us tonight. You're going to be hearing from Brother Brian Abernathy. Brian Abernathy is the Director of Promotions for our Global Ministries Worldwide, based in St. Louis, Missouri. But he's also a student of prophecy, the book of Revelation, and some great things in the Scripture. And We've asked him tonight to just speak for whatever he sees in the Word of God that would be of great benefit to us at this particular time that we're facing. So he's going to be speaking through the lens of prophecy and the Word of God and just sharing with us some great things tonight and how this relates to us taking the gospel to the whole world. And I know you'll be blessed by this ministry. I also want to remind you, we're looking forward to this week. We're going to have a great time as we come back into the sanctuary for a great time of our three services, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 12 noon. And uh, we're going to be adding Sunday school this week, Sunday school and nursery. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone we've been working at decorating the church and this new church. It's going to be such a great blessing to so many. So enjoy tonight's message, and we'll look forward to also seeing you this weekend. In Jesus' name. Greetings to the East Wind Pentecostal Church of Palm Bay. It is my privilege and honor to be with you this evening and to share a little bit of a Bible study with you. I want to thank your pastor, Pastor Myers, for allowing me to do this and trusting me to do this. And I am looking forward to sharing the Word of God with you tonight and seeing what God can reveal to us by His precious Word. I'm going to read tonight from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. 
which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Blessed Word of God. Blessed Word of God. In hearing the words of announcers and newscasters across this nation alone, they constantly are using the words, we are living in very uncertain times. Surely from man's perspective, these are uncertain times. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. America's once proud economy, the envy of the world, currently has its massive death being propped up by foreigners. We have seen in two short months in the stay-in-place law the literal dismantling of the economy that was thriving and now is turned into a recession that may take years to fully recover from the devastation of this horrible COVID-19 virus. And the daily headlines read like the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 about the end times. In verse 4 he said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. I hear voices right now that are saying this is the tribulation and the wrath of God. I wholeheartedly disagree. This is part of the circumstances that God uses in the last days to open the eyes of men and women to his power and to his coming. Many are afraid during this spreading virus and sure that God is pouring out his wrath somehow and using it to destroy the ungodly. I again have to disagree. This is a virus and nothing more. While God may allow this to happen to open our eyes to his glory and also show us what he will accomplish by it, it is not his wrath. May I say unto you who are portraying this to be the tribulation in the words of my father-in-law O.C. Crabtree, if if this is the tribulation, ladies and gentlemen, we've got it made in the shade. If this is all that God can produce in the lines of his wrath, he's not as powerful as the scripture clearly says that he is. My friends, when the day of his wrath shall come, the Bible says, who shall be able to stand? But let me be quick to say that out of this, God will get glory. Let me point out some things that I believe clarify what this has done and is doing and how this should open the eyes of the church in this last hour. Notice how quickly the control of our lives has been taken away by government and rule. We are quarantined to stay in place, and we did it. We were told social distancing, and we did it. We were made by law that no gatherings of more than 10, ten people could happen, and we did it. We were daily given scare tactics of no medical supplies or hospital preparedness. We still have no cure or vaccine. And even from that, people of state and renown are telling us we need a one world rule, a one world government, and a one world vaccination. Mr. Gates even made the statement that we need everyone microchipped to tell whether they've been vaccinated or not. When all of this has happened, the world cowered in their homes and did nothing but watch screens for guidance and help from governments that were confused and helpless. The world is adrift in chaos and confusion. People are desperate and fearful with no clue about what to do or how to respond. May I say that this world is totally unprepared for what is going to happen when the tribulation truly does come. It will take the world in fear. Notice all the death notices we get daily to keep us under control. My Bible says in Luke 21 and 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. That fear, ladies and gentlemen, is abundant. It's already here and it's evident on the earth. In a matter of weeks, we've seen store shelves emptied. We have seen businesses closed that may never open again. We've seen a thriving 
economy go right back into recession that may take us years to come out of. We've assumed a huge amount added to our national debt that will require our great-grandchildren and their children to work trying to pay it off if the world is still here in the shape that is in today. You better believe the world is in fear. You better believe that they are worried about tomorrow. And the church of the living God is in the middle of this situation. And let, it, let me say this feeling should not be so among us. John 14 and 1, Jesus told his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But we have more than hope right here. We have hope in the life to come. The words fear not are mentioned 365 times in God's holy word. One for every day of the year. So I'm saying to the church, don't fear, don't fret. Look unto the heavens. God is still on the throne. Never before has there been a day more orchestrated, outlined, and organized by the sovereign hand of the Almighty God. In the course of human events, there has never been a more certain time. God is directing, dictating the events of every day, everywhere, and everyone on this planet. So I lift my voice in this Bible study to declare in this troubled time, we live in certain times. No matter what the news says, no matter what the generation around us says, we live in certain times. God knows and is determining the events on this planet. There is nothing left to chance or fate. The Lord Jesus Christ remains large and even more in charge than at any other time in human history. God is in control. While man is indeed totally uncertain, God is completely certain. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. He has the answer for this last day. And while the strengths of governments and men are now adrift in weakness, anarchy, and confusion, the greater truth is found in the book of Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Yes, sir, ladies and gentlemen, God is in control, and we are living in certain times. In the midst of this unprecedented time, there's a renewed look to prophecy, the search for answers as to what has happened, what is going to happen, and has taken place in this world. To the point, literally, that it is almost an obsession with a sense of desperation. As a full-time student of the Scripture, I've spent my life in concentrated study and discovery of the truths of the Word of God. And I believe that Satan's key strategy against us is to distract and divide in this area, to pull or sway our focus away from God's Word and see things that are temporal and will ultimately fade away. In that quest, I would submit this big picture view of the New Testament. There is one book of prophecy within the New Testament. It's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. There are 21 books addressed to the believers, churches, called by name and addressed to them specifically. These epistle letters huh, to the saved are written with the express purpose of helping them navigate the process of transformation, God's work in us after conversion. They are guidelines on how to mature and how to grow in Jesus Christ after the new birth. That is a 21 to 1 ratio of information we need on how to stay saved in this world versus clues on end times and prophetic detail. I was honored and privileged to have the most gifted and informed teachers of prophecy in the post Azusa Street era, Reverend O.C. Crabtree and my father Charles Abernathy. Both of these great men were students and teachers of prophecy for many years. 
I believe they forgot more than most will ever know about prophecy and the book of Revelation and the details of the end time. They both refused to fill in all the blanks or ID the symbolism. They taught the literal word of God as it was revealed and written. My father called it the unadulterated word. Literally it means the word of God without our flesh interjected into its meaning. Truly people are determined to fill the blanks of prophecy. Who's the Antichrist? What is the mark of the beast? What does 666 mean to the people in everyday terms? How long is the tribulation? When does it start in relation to the rapture? Well, there are clear answers and directives on all of these subjects and all of these questions and many other questions found only in the Word of God. John 5 and 39 says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal eternal life and they are they which testify of me and I go right back to Revelation 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ are you looking for him or are you looking for these things here's what I know about the Word of God it is absolute truth there are no contradictions there is nothing left to any private interpretation Isaiah 28 and 10 says it this way for precept must be upon precept precept upon precept line upon line line upon line here a little and there a little God's Word is God's Word not for man to twist or adjust to his earthly agenda or ideas it is God's Word. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16 brought this very scary circumstance to the eyes of the church. As also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. W-R-E-S-T and as they do also the other scriptures unto their destruction. The word rest here means to wrestle, to strain, to twist, or torture the scriptures. Self-interpretations of God's word will always lead to destructions of the soul. The word of God is living, timeless, and relevant to all generations. The scripture clearly and without question outlines the elements of the new birth being born of the water and of the Spirit. John 3 verse 5 And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. That's what the Word says. Acts 2 and 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost there is nothing left to chance or man's personal spin or agenda it is yea and amen let God be true and thus saith the Lord the areas of the book of Revelation that are not detailed but left to John's visions and description of heavenly events were earthly words that were intentional and anyone who tries to decode those details are guessing at best and dece deceived literally at worst. May I remind you that John, the verse that I read to you, Revelation 1, 1 through 8, John said, I recorded these things. John was a recorder and a witness of what he saw, not a disseminator of what he thought it was. He did not put his personal thoughts, ideas, or interpretations of what was revealed by the Spirit of God to him in the Holy Ghost. He simply recorded what he saw. In that light, who do we think we are to guess at what it all means or what is the revelation of things that we did not even eyewitness? If God wanted us to know all things, he would have clearly outlined these details in his word. However... There is a clear message 
in Revelation, vital to this day, that has been heretofore overlooked in the mindless pursuit of details left out by the unction of the Holy Ghost. We do not know all things. We will not know all things until we are resurrected to be with Him. While we are here, Paul said, we look through a glass darkly. The truth to be gleaned was certainly from the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. Most try and make sense of the visions of the Revelation by looking to the future, decoding its images in terms of the contemporary politics and forecasting somehow our history and how it will unfold. This can be referred to, I would like to say, as newspaper prophecy. This is whenever a new thing that comes out and happens, it has already become a gospel of what is in Revelation according to what these people say at that time. Unfortunately, things change so drastically, no one ever takes the time to go back in their prophetic history teachings to do a fact-checking on their statements. That's why we've heard for years statements such as, The Antichrist was Stalin. Henry Kissinger's the Antichrist. Gorbachev, he's got the mark on his head. Obama and many others were the Antichrist. But as the church is still here, we know that none of them are the Antichrist. The church will not see the Antichrist according to the Word of God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 10. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The wording is caught up out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. I'm here to tell you that if you see the Antichrist, you miss the rapture. I'm not here to see the Antichrist. I'm here to see the Christ. The church will be caught up and caught away, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. In making this a private interpretation or resting of the Scripture, there's a fatal flaw to the laws of exegesis in all Scripture. A text is written to make sense of its initial audience, those whom it was originally written to. Revelation did not come from Patmos with a do not read till the 20th century label on it. It was not sealed up as Daniel's book was. It has been read and studied from the time it was written until now, and it is still for no private interpretation. It was a vital document to the seven churches of Asia Minor, to whom it was addressed and intended, the church. The book of Revelation, with its amazing and fantastic images, invites the believers in the last decade of the first century to perceive the truth within the realities they were facing daily, just as it speaks to us in the same intention today in the 21st century. The, the book of Revelation invites these first century Christians first to one, freedom from the myth of the Roman emperor as a divine creator. Number two, escape the tainted prosperity that beguiled the Mediterranean culture. And number three, be loosed from the violence dubbed the rule of law, Roman law. It was written to free them to live their lives within the truth of the gospel and to adhere to divine truth that is of eternal value and let go of man inspired traditions and falsehood. The purpose of Revelation is not only to discern the fulfillment of its predictions in contemporary history or to map out the last seven years of tribulation. Rather, its message is to discern the true nature of the society around us in the terms of Jesus Christ the triumphant lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and in the light of the fact that the wrath of God awaits the unrighteous. Some that pursue knowledge of the Antichrist need to know Jesus Christ and leave the satanic apparitions to the judgment of a righteous God. You are always better off to see Jesus than anything else. Our view is skewed by the teachings and interpretations of those that insert their own private thoughts and ideas, those who try to decode its vision with regard to events happening now and from this news world that occurs globally and in the U.S. 
So far, we've been able to overlook the annual revisions necessary to these efforts, still giving ear to the latest best guess that another new year brings, new ideas, new names. They're not right at any time. The more detail they offer, the more they err. People are cynical, skeptical, and unbelieving. It has created a literal unbelief amongst those who would hear the Word of God and be saved. There are basic rules of engagement in the study of all texts, principles which enable us to study and glean from the literature of antiquity. Foundational to this process is discovering the genre of the text and what form it was written in. Let's consider three of these views. First off, Revelation as a letter. It was addressed to specific congregations, seven churches of Asia, dealing with local issues within them. Secondly, Revelation as early Christian prophecy. This doesn't mean predictions. Rather, it is a declaration of what God is doing at present, God's perspective on the present life of His people. If there are points about the future, it is usually imminent, not distant. And finally, Revelation as the Apocalypse. The book of Revelation as the Apocalypse means unveiling or lifting the veil. Therefore, we have to ask the question, what is thus unveiled? The current events of the audience are placed in the context of a sacred history of God's activity and carefully defined plan. Life on earth is put in the context of the invisible world and our human situation is put in the context of the supernatural. Here's a key point. An apocalypse is a communication that puts everyday situations in perspective by looking at the larger context, eternity that is certain and unfolding. Hence, it has the power to comfort the marginalized, encourage the discouraged, and to inspire all to live values that are consistent with their faith in the Word of God. If you believe in Jesus and His promises, and that He will come again, you need to live like it. Be ready to go and demonstrate that priority in the choices that you make on all fronts are the right choices by the Word of God. The purpose of the apocalypse is not to figure out future events. Rather, it is to get the reader to examine their behavior in light of pending end time happenings. The beginning of eternity marked by eternal life or eternal death and damnation can be shown by how we live our lives right now. It is God's way of getting us prepared for His coming. Let's talk about the purpose of the book of Revelation for people in the here and now. The reader of this great book can see the fact that no matter what the present world is claiming, no matter what the world powers would aspire to, God is the final source of all events. His truth endures. He is in control, and all power in heaven and earth belong to Him. Isaiah 66 and verse 1 said, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build? unto me, and where is the place of my rest? The words, the house that ye build. The ye literally refers to the future builders of his habitation. That would be us, the church. The place of his rest is not the tabernacle or the temple. That was always a place of sacrifice, atonement. The only place God finds his resting place is in the souls of men when he fills them with the Holy Ghost. His footstool, therefore, becomes the resting place that he lives in, the body of of Jesus Christ the church. But even with all this confusion, fear, and worry, the church knows our God rules and reigns, and nothing happens without His hand being in it. There is nothing outside of His grasp or knowledge. He has all things in His control, and He will bring a glory and order with His kingdom out of this chaos that we're living in today. John the Revelator saw his glory when he was translated or raptured in the Spirit to the heavenly temple in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. 
and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. John is translated, raptured literally, from the Isle of Patmos up into the heavenly temple. And then verse 2 says, And immediately... I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne aren't you glad you know there is only one God and what his name is Jesus Christ can I assure the saints of God today Jesus is on the throne he is still in control he is still in charge he will have his will and his way until the end and no man can change it be encouraged today and know he will do all things right and he will bring revival in the midst of chaos and fear and while the world is shaking and literally out of control Jesus Christ will pour out a fire across this earth that will bring a great outpouring of his spirit upon lost souls before the rapture we are in those last days today. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 1 through 5, This know also, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away we see these things growing daily before our eyes but the Bible commands us from such turn away turn to a higher power turn your face toward the one who has all things in control and while we see these things we also see the prophecy of the word of God from the prophet Joel before Paul ever penned his words to Timothy of the dread of the last days Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and upon also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and then he switches gears in verse 30 and I'll explain why that is in just a moment I will shoot wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood fire pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call here's the great assurance to the church in living right now in the last days while verses 28 and 29 are talking about the outpouring of God's spirit upon the souls of hungry mankind worldwide that is what's happening among us church and the world right now not tomorrow not next year, not in the future, but right now the Holy Ghost is being poured out across this word, world. Verses 32 and verses 30 through 32 are after the church age. The Jews could not see the church age. There was a blindness put upon them, and they saw only the Jewish happenings. But due to the spiritual blindness, they could not see, and that's why they rejected Messiah. But we, the church, the blood-bought throng, the redeemed, those called by his name, are living in this outpouring and seeing a greater move of God today than we ever have in the history of the church when we look at the book of Acts we see 120 at the day of Pentecost filled with the Holy Ghost 3,000 5,000 were added in a few more chapters. And while we rejoice that we are living in a church's greatest hour it is greater today than it was then. We had over 5,000 receive the Holy Ghost in just a few days in several places across the world that had crusades. Bangladesh over 5,600, Manila, over 5,300, and over 3,600 in Malawi, Africa. Right now, today, that's what's happening. So no matter how real the lies of this culture may appear, the greater truth is defined not by man or events, 
rather by the Word of God, and it is the final say on all matters to determine the ultimate truth for all life on this planet. Nothing supersedes the inerrant Word of God. Romans 3 and 4, God forbid. Let God be true, but every man a liar. There's an eternity coming, one which will reward good according to God's word, and one which will punish and judge evil according to the same word. Society, earthly power, does not have an influence in this process. Rather, it is subject to it. Cultures, ethos, philosophy, principles, personal beliefs of man cannot change the truth of the word of God at any time or any place. Place. Read the amazing vision of the New Jerusalem, its splendor and reward for the bride of Jesus Christ. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I want to share with you an amazing place of peace and treasure where the greatest wealth on the earth is reduced to the lowest use there. What we consider most of value, God turns and uses to build his holy city. Streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, precious stones for foundation. All of these things that we put into vaults and banks for safety and riches are nothing more than building materials to God for his holy city to share with his holy bride. The world will be judged with multiple manifestations of the wrath of God in proportions they have never seen and cannot be comprehended. When he pours it out, it will be without mercy, it will be unrelenting, and it will be without historical equal. Men will cry out to die for relief. They will shake their fists at the heaven unrepentant, but they will find no relief. They will not repent and will be destroyed in their pride. The world, will, the world will follow evil only to see it destroyed by God's power and will be ultimately ruled by righteousness and godliness without choice in the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth after the tribulation. More important than the identity of the Antichrist is the fact the risen Christ will crush, vanquish all evil and sin, and it will be paid with an eternal price. I am not looking to see the Antichrist. I am longing to see Jesus Christ, who saved me, gave his life for me, and redeemed me from my sins. I encourage everyone, read the book of Revelation. Don't be afraid of it. It'll bless you. It makes it clear that this present life must be lived in a way as to be prepared for eternity. That whatever we must endure in this life, it is nothing to be compared with the glory of the next life in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. It also would lead us to understand that no pleasure for a season in this life could possibly be worth the wrath and the horror of the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It behooves us to constantly be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. No, it's not about mystery solved or the future predicted. It's about the opportunity to be ready for the certainty of an eternity that rewards this life and how it was lived in the eternal context. The message to the church in the first century is the same as to the one to the church in the 21st century. Jesus Christ was literally <clears throat> the Word of God incarnate. John 1 and 1 and John 1 and 14. Verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Word never changes. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Friend, this life ends and leads to eternity with consequences for how we lived in anticipation of that truth. My father used to say that this life is the dress rehearsal for eternity that is to come. Hebrews 9 and 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Revelation unveils the fact that 
that our conduct here and how our choices in this thing called life that is but a vapor has the impact that will last for eternity. Revelation is truly valuable as it establishes the fact that there is coming a time when the mercy of God on this planet and upon mankind will be replaced by His wrath that is open to all like the great seals on a book poured out like vials and His judgment which is sounded out like trumpets. Don't think for a moment in 2020 that these are uncertain times. We live we live in certain times. Never has there been a time more certain on this earth than today. The end is upon us. The images of Revelation are in place to become reality for all people that are left behind. Ready for eternity, reward beyond imagination and eternal judge or eternal judgment and hell. Where the horror is beyond comprehension, there's no end, no relief. Eternity is either in heaven or in hell, and you will spend it in one place or the other by how you live right now. Your life decides your destiny. In heaven, Revelation 21 and verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, never to weep again. There shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away but in hell it's a whole different picture Revelation 20 and verse 10 and says and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever there's no end to hell and I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I've had many times the question of what are these books, Brother Abernathy, and do we know the the words of these books. Yes, you do. They will never judge us for something we do not know. That would be unjust of a just God. We will be judged by the Word of God, the Bible, which we have, which we've had for centuries. <clears throat> that book, that holy book, is our guideline to lead us to eternal life with Jesus Christ. The book of life is in God's hands. And that's when he puts your names upon the page, when you are born again of the water and of the Spirit, when you're blood-bought, just as the lentils on the doorpost in Israel, while they were in Egypt's bondage, were coated with the blood of a spotless lamb. It saved them from the judgment that came through the land of Egypt. Goshen did not have children dying. I want to tell you that you have to put your life in the Word of God today because it is the only saving source to get you ready for the coming of the Lord. Are you trying to scare us, Brother Abernathy? Oh, would to God I could scare everybody to repentance and baptism in Jesus' name, being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, and to live a godly overcoming life. But I'm not the one who wrote the book. The book was given from God. So it should scare us in one way, but it also should assure us in the other. If we're ready to go, there's nothing to fear. If we're not, we should be afraid. I would ask you to look at life in the context of this great book called Revelation. See the end of days and ask yourself, what am I doing in light of these certain events that await humanity? Am I living today like it will all end soon it will all end quickly. We're seeing things happen so fast we can't even keep up with it. Am I prepared? Am I prepared for His coming? And if I'm not, I need to get prepared. We live in a culture that is so compelling. 
It would try to control us, our values, our beliefs, our actions. We must live in a way that transcends the culture and embraces the truth of eternity. Let me speak with clarity and unction to all that hear the sound of my voice tonight. Jesus Christ is coming for His church, and it's time to get ready. I'm going to ask you some simple questions. Are you ready for the rapture, my friend? Have you made your calling and election sure? If Jesus came tonight, would you hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or would you see that others have left and you've been left behind? Have you repented of your sins? Have you been baptized in Jesus' name by immersion? Have you received the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance? And are you living a godly, righteous, holy, overcoming life in the midst of an ungodly world? If not, I ask you to hear the word of the Lord today. Humble yourself into His saving hands and get your soul ready for His coming. Jesus Christ is coming and it's time to get ready. Thank you so much for allowing me to spend some time with you and just share an overview of Revelation, what it is and what it is not. And I would pray that you would delve into the Word of God in these dark days. And I also would pray that you have faith and understand that God's in control. And if you're one of His children, you have nothing to fear or worry about. There's going to trumpet sound, and we're going to be changed from mortal to immortality, from corruption to incorruption. And we will meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. I love the ending of the book of Revelation. John the Revelator, after recording all of these things that were going to come to pass, constantly reminds us on several occasions in that last chapter alone. And he says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And with the church, that should be the cry of our hearts. Because we're ready. We're prepared. We're living it. We should always say in our prayer, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. God bless you tonight. May the Lord have his hand upon you and your church and give you a mighty revival that lasts until his coming. What an amazing e-connect that we just had. And now we are asking that everybody takes time for themselves and applies this word through discussion. Just as we have made it very important and stressed the importance of us applying the word through prayer. And of course, we still want you to do that. We are now asking that everyone takes time with your family. If you don't have your family with you, maybe call a friend. Call somebody in the church. Text somebody. And let's all apply this word now through discussion discussion. We want to encourage you to get involved in the Go program, which helps to support many ministries that are making an impact in our church, our community, and all over the globe. Each month, on the first Sunday of the month, we give you the opportunity to support these great ministries. When you give to Go, it supports church ministries that helps provide a home and education to children that are unwanted or orphaned. It helps troubled teenage boys find structure and guidance in their life. It helps get the Word of God into our teenagers through Bible quizzing and through camps and other student events. It helps to support and build brand new churches that are starting right here in North America and more. When you give to go, it supports community ministries that helps provide disaster relief to those that are in need. It helps provide pregnant young women with support to prevent abortions. It helps to protect our religious liberties right here in the United States. And it helps our Hands for Healing ministry feed thousands of families each week right here in Brevard County. Also, when you give to go, it supports global ministries that helps to build churches and orphanages all around the world. And it helps to hold crusades and see thousands of people receive the Holy Ghost and receive a miracle from God. And it helps to provide financial support to missionaries 
all around the globe. When you become a part of Go, together we impact and spread the love of God all over our church, our community, and our world.